Hey everyone, so it looks like everyone's jumping on the Dino bandwagon. So I figured I probably should make a video on it. Originally I was going to wait until Dino has a go-to web framework because there's still a little bit of competition. And while Oak has the most stars and is the most popular, it's still really early to judge where it goes. But if I'm going to just make a random Dino tutorial, I want to try out Dactyl because they use decorators. So it's going to be a lot like Nest.js, which you all know that I'm a big fan of. So let's get started. We'll make a new directory called dinodactyl cd into it. And the first file we need is a tsconfig.json. So we'll create that and open it up. And this is because we need to tell Dino to use decorators, which is for some reason still experimental after all these years. And don't worry, I'm still going to use VS Code for this project. So once you open it up, let's quickly create a index file and that's going to be our entry file for our application. And let's hide this terminal. And I haven't installed the Dino extension, so I'm going to need to do that. And this will allow Dino to know our imports. So then we could import from external modules, which is going to be this file here. And if you want to explore the repository for your Dactyl or any other Dino project, the mod file is going to be basically the exports. So this is all the functions and methods that we're going to be able to use by adding this one line. And to get things started, all we really need is the application, which we can declare our app as a new application. The new application does take a parameter. And it's going to be an object. And right now, all we need is controllers. And it'll be empty for now. But we can await app.run. And this requires a port number. And I'm just going to supply us with 8080. And now we can run our application. So to run a Dino application, you just type Dino run and then pass the necessary arguments. So we're going to supply the config of TS config because we need that for our decorators a little later on. But we also need to add allow net and that's for security purposes. But it's telling Dino that we're allowing this application to use the network. And then lastly, we need to add the entry file, which is going to be index.ts. And there we go, we have a server running. It's a pretty cute prompt actually. <laughs> but unfortunately this server doesn't actually do anything. We're just running it and it's kind of dumb, honestly. So I'm going to kill the server and this terminal. And to fix that, we're going to need some controllers. And for this REST API, I think I'm going to just go with the example that Dactyl gives us. So we're going to do some CRUD with dinosaurs. And by naming convention, I'm going to use the Angular or Nest.js the name of the file followed by the type then followed by the file extension that way we don't have to deal with capital letters now in here we're also going to want to add the import and let's just get the controller for now actually we want to get so then we could set up the app controller and i'm going to prefix it with api slash and then the resource name and then for our get path this is the endpoint that we're going to hit i'm just going to return a simple object of hello world world uh, there we go and it's just to check that our application works and we can test it with something like postman or insomnia and for those of you that don't know insomnia is the same as postman but it also can do graphql or that was the big selling point postman now could do graphql but that's a thing anyways the main reason why i'm using insomnia is because it's lighter weight so my computer doesn't die basically Anyways, I'm going to do a send request here, and it's not found. I wonder why. Oh, that is because I need to actually register the controller. So we'll import it. And a weird thing about Dino is that you have to include the file extension. I mean, it's not weird. That's a good idea, but I'm not used to it because I'm used to Node. Anyways, we'll add dinosaur controller here and rerun our application and we get our little hello world from dinosaur so i went ahead and added a docker compose file so that we can use postgres for our database if you already have postgres installed locally you won't have to do this but the database that we're going to touch is dinosaurs next we're going to install a database feature to this because i find that tutorials without a data persistence layer is kind of useless in terms of a rest api 
And specifically, the ORM that we're going to be using is DinoDB. Now, the steps we're going to follow will work for these four other databases. So you can use this for Mongo or SQLite or MySQL. And we're going to get started on creating the database. Before we get started, let's um, manage our dependencies a little better and store them all in a depths folder. We'll have one for Dactyl and DinoDB. And the URL that we used earlier for Dactyl, we're going to just export everything. And the reason why I'm splitting up in files is because just in case there's naming collisions, we won't have to worry about that. And then the DinoDB file, we'll add this. Now, I don't know if this is the best way to do it since we kind of have a node modules situation going on. But the bulk of all the files are still being hosted remotely. So I think it's kind of better. I'm not sure though. With that out of the way, we can now replace all these remote imports with a local one. And remember .ts for the file extension. We'll do the same thing for the dinosaurs controller. And now we can start on our database file, which will just create a file called db. We're going to want to import something from DinoDB, and that'll be the database, so that we can instantiate a new database object, which takes an object that we have to send in all the connection options. The first parameter is actually the type of database that we're connecting to, and this one's for Postgres. And we're exporting the database, so in our entry file, we should import it so that our application knows that it exists. And before we run the app, let's sync the database so we don't have to do migrations on our... All right, and before updating the controller, we're gonna need one more thing. And that's gonna be the dinosaur model. And the dinosaur model is gonna act as both the data model for our application as well as the repository. We're gonna need two things, which is the model and also all the possible database data types. Dinosaur model is gonna inherit from model. And all the properties inside of dinosaur model is going to be prefixed with the static type. And fields is going to specify all the table columns inside of our Postgres database. Right. For the ID, I'm going to go with the UUID. And we also want to make sure that the ID is the primary key. The other fields we can just set to the data types of string. We don't have to open up an object because we're not specifying any other special properties to it. But I do want to add a couple of special properties to the model itself. And one of them is the table name of dinosaurs. So our database isn't called dinosaur models in the tables, which makes no sense. And then I'm going to specify timestamps as true. And that's just going to programmatically add the updated and created dates. All right, to make sure that the database knows about that model, we need to link it. And link takes an array where we just send in all of the possible data models. All right, cool. Now we can go back into our controller and import dinosaur model and then get all dinosaurs. We can do a table select and return all. Now this is going to return a promise. For us to use await, we need to add async to the function name. Now we can restart our server and check this in our insomnia or postman. And there we have it. All that work for an empty array. Of course, this means that we can start working on the actual CRUD operations, so this API actually returns us useful data. So I ran into a little bit of problems with the ID field, specifically because we're using a UUID. So I'm going to just replace it with the integer, and I assume that's mostly because DinoDB is still in flux, as the entire framework and runtime is still brand new, so there's still kinks being worked out. So instead, we're going to replace it with an integer and auto-increment to true, which is the classic implementation of most SQL databases. And once you have this updated, if you already run your app a few times, you might want to update the sync and set drop to true. And this will just drop your entire database and recreate all the tables from scratch. But I've already done that, so I'm going to set it to false, which is optional. You could instead opt to just not put in a parameter instead. But now that we've done that, we could actually go back to our controller and focus on the implementation details. So first, let's just add all the stubs for create, read, update, and delete, and work on all of them one by one. I'm also going to go ahead and prefix all of them with async, because we know that we're going to be using promises. But for create, it's going to be a post request to slash. And in our argument, we want to access the request body, and we can do that with the body decorator. 
The data type is going to be any for now, but we'll fix that in a bit. And then DinoDB, we can access it using the create method. But for type safety, let's go back into our model and create a DTO. And this interface is going to act as our view model because the data flowing between the client and the server doesn't actually have the ID because that's going to be in the database layer. Instead, this model will only have the name and period because the ID as well as the timestamps are going to be auto-generated by Postgres. And then inside of depths of DinoDB, the library doesn't actually expose the TypeScript types. So instead of importing them directly from their repo, I'm going to create another type here called values, any string as the key. And then the value could be any JavaScript data type. And the reason for this is because you'll see the create method. If we hover, it takes in a, a value type, which is a bit stricter than the any type in TypeScript. So if we start using our DTO here. We'll get a red squiggly because it doesn't match, even though they're essentially compatible. So back in our dinosaur model, we could just add extends here of values, and that will tell TypeScript that these two types are actually compatible. So that takes care of the create route. Now let's do the get at the ID, which conveniently we also get a decorator called param, and that will return to us the ID inside of the URL parameters. And here we use the dinosaur model to do a find on that particular ID. Update is a put request at slash ID. And it's going to be a combination of get and create. So we need that ID parameter as well as the body data. Here I want to get a little fancier. So we're going to actually store the dinosaur that we find in a variable. Just so that if a dinosaur isn't found, we can throw a not found exception. And then Dactyl will take care of responding to the client. With this exception but if the dinosaur does exist we can update the model we can update the data accordingly using this syntax we have to place the where first and then the reason why dinosaur is in a let is because we're going to rebind it to find the updated data entry that we created so that in our return we can actually send back the newly updated dinosaur and let's scroll down and then for delete we only need the param but we'll follow the same pattern as where we do a find Throw a not found exception if it's not found, and then delete that dinosaur by the ID. And we can return the JSON representation of deleted true. And also, since that dinosaur is already stored in a constant variable, we can return that data too. And I believe our controller is done. So we can rerun our server. And if everything is according to plan, we could go into Insomnia and test this out. So the get all routes should return an empty array once again because we don't have any data. So let's go ahead and switch to the post route, add some data to send, and let's create that. And there we have it. We have our newly created Tyrannosaurus Rex. We can also add a Velociraptor from the Cretaceous period. This way we'll have two coming back from our initial get endpoint. And now we can select each of them, any one of them. And I'm just gonna go with the T-Rex at ID of one and get that singular one. There's our T-Rex. And let's say we want to update it to just have the name of T-Rex. Now ideally, we don't have to add the period in an update. Let's see if this works. And there we have it. We have our newly named T-Rex. And finally, we just need to check our delete endpoint. And delete is true. And to fully check if delete went through, we need to go to get all. And everything in the database is just the Velociraptor. So there we have it. Our API is done. And also in your terminal, you could go see all the logs here, which is a nice little feature that I actually kind of like about Dactyl. But there you have it. That's a REST API built in Dino using the Dactyl web framework, which is a little bit like Nest.js. And if you're coming from Java Spring or c .net, it should be pretty familiar as well. Now, I wouldn't recommend using Dino right away because it's still very early. And even the Dactyl framework itself has some features that are still being worked on. So if you scroll down, there are two things that are still in the works, which is the ability for a dependency injection, as well as a before. And the before decorator, there is a little sample here that's being used over here. And this is supposed to be for validating the body data from the client. Unfortunately, right now it's not available. So it'll be a while before Dacto is a more mature framework. But in any case, that was a fun experiment. And I hope all of you enjoyed this video. If you did, consider subscribing and following. If not, that's cool too. But I will see you all next time.